Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to worship at New Dublin. I am delighted to see you all and delighted that we can worship the Lord together this morning. There are a number of important announcements in your bulletin, not as many as usual, but they are there and important, so I encourage you to look at them. We will be having our last first Sunday feast, last potluck, September the 4th, um, and I believe that will also be our final bout of outdoor worship, first Sunday outdoor worship, before we move into the fall and the fall scheduling. We will continue then to host Lemonade on the Lawn. Uh, we're trying to keep it simple this year, Teresa says, so it's not a whole lot of work on anybody's part. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the back, and if you have questions, Teresa's number is in the bulletin. Finally, on August the 18th, so that's not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, Dublin UMC and New Dublin Presbyterian are joining together to have a little ecumenical Bible study here in our fellowship hall, and they are invited, and you all are invited, and I know that our churches have lots of friends and family in both places, so we will join together uh, to study Psalm 1. Uh, in our fellowship hall. Is there anything else that needs to come to our attention this morning? Choir practice this week, Tuesday the 10th, instead of Wednesday. That's important. And let us prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of the Almighty God. as you are able, and join me in the call to worship. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Let us pray. Lord our God, we are glad for your invitation to come and worship you this morning and for your promise that you will meet us here. And we pray that all of our distractions and other concerns would be put aside for the moment so that we would truly meet you here and leave encouraged and refreshed on our journey through Christ our Lord. Amen. The hymn is number 91 in the red hymnal.
be seated. And as today is the second Sunday of the month, and we are once again taking up offerings the normal way, uh, we do have um, the two cents a meal offering box up here, and you are welcome to come and give to that. And let's meanwhile go, let's see, what's next? Nope, we're not going to, I had things confused in my head. Go ahead. <laughs> That's a good question. This is, um, it's for hunger. Our whole presbytery does this, and possibly more than our presbytery. Um, and it, 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 uh, it's a, a small offering that we take once a month uh, to, to help with hunger in our communities. In 1 John, we discover that it is a perennial temptation to try to make ourselves out to be better than we are. Uh, but the author of 1 John says that when we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and do not practice the truth. But when we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So on the strength of that promise, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In Romans 8, we read these words of comfort. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. 
And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. And Christ prays for us. So believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And be at peace. We come to hear the scriptures read and proclaimed. Let us pray. Lord, we know that 
you caused these scriptures to be written not because you needed them, but because we need them. And we give you thanks that you have given them to us and preserved them through to this time. And we pray that as we hear the words of this passage and as I preach, it would not be any voice but yours that we hear, because no voice but yours will do. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. As I promised a while ago now, today we are starting the book of James. Uh, and we will go straight through it, as we've been doing recently. And today we are starting with James chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. Hear the word of the Lord. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to you. But ask in faith, never doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For the doubter, being double-minded and unstable in every way, must not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Let the believer who is lowly boast in being raised up and the rich in being brought low, because the rich will disappear like a flower in the field. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the field. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. It is the same way with the rich. In the midst of a busy life, they will wither away. Blessed is anyone who endures temptation, such a one has stood the test and will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. No one, when tempted, should say, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. Then, when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and that sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my beloved. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is the word of the Lord. Be well, even just with this first reading, I suspect you noticed that James does not mince words. The whole book is like that, and sometimes it's worse. If you're looking for a plain, clear, no frills added account of what the Christian life ought to look like, James is a good place to start. You're going to find short, sometimes rapid fire commands illustrated with everyday metaphors like fire and water and plants. They're usually just as accessible today as they were the day they were written. James himself is traditionally identified with Jesus' younger brother, who we learn uh, was James the Apostle in the book of Acts. Like Paul must have uh, become an apostle after Jesus' death and resurrection. Uh, but some people doubt it. They think James is a pretty common name and you know, it doesn't really matter either way whether the author of James was Jesus, his brother, or not, uh, because it's not the physical relationship to Jesus that's important here, and certainly he does not mention it. The important 
relationship is the spiritual one. He says, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he identifies himself at the beginning of this letter. He wrote it probably around 40 AD, so that's roughly 30 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. It's important to remember uh, the Gospels come first in the canon, in the book, wherever it is, but the epistles were usually written first. The letters were usually written first. Uh, So one of the things that you might notice off the bat is the sharp difference between James and Paul. Paul usually has a lot more explanation than James has. He can be harder to understand. Sometimes he's easier because he explains himself more. And while Paul is really worried about dead works, works that don't spring from a saving grace of Jesus, works by which we try to save ourselves by ourselves, James has a different emphasis. He is more worried about dead faith. He's more worried about Christians who try to use their faith as an excuse not to do anything about it. The work of becoming more holy, the work of caring for and loving our fellow humans in difficult and practical ways. So we need both. We need James and we need Paul, because one way or the other, we're probably falling off one of those edges. And Paul's letters usually are addressed to a single congregation in a local place, concerned with the specific characteristic struggles of that congregation. James is written to anybody who might pick it up. The 12 tribes in the dispersion, it says. Anybody who happens to be around, greetings. The address includes us, too, as a reminder that we, too, have been grafted into the body of God's people. It's, at the time, addressed to probably a primarily Jewish audience living in, but not, or around, but not in Israel. Meant to be passed around, not a single congregation. And that's it for the greeting. Much shorter than Paul's usually are. Paul sometimes takes six verses to even acknowledge who he's writing the letter to. And then he takes another six to talk about them. Uh, But James is in a hurry. And so he says, greetings. And then he dives right in to today's reading and to, in some ways, the theme of the whole letter, which is the pursuit of spiritual wholeness in face of the difficult realities of the Christian life, even through the difficult realities of the Christian life. It's obvious to James, he takes it without question, that Christians will be facing hard times, that they're not evidence of God's punishing us or being angry with us, in the most faithful life, suffering will be, in some instances, the dominant reality. James isn't interested so much in answering that popular question, why do bad things happen to good people? He just takes it for granted that they do and focuses on the faithful response to that kind of suffering. Life hurts, according to James. But despite that hurt and through that hurt, God is not calling us to damage, but to health and wholeness. And so he gets down very quickly to brass tacks. My brothers and sisters, he says, whatever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. That's counterintuitive. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And when endurance has had its full effect, you will be mature and complete and lacking in nothing. I don't know about you. I have a hard time doing this when I'm actually going through something painful. On the other side, I can look back sometimes and see maybe a little bit of God's grace in my pain. Not always, but very rarely can I see it when I'm in the middle of it. Maybe that's your experience, too. 
But James calls us to trust that it's there even when we can't see or understand it. And when we can't, he says, we're to pray for wisdom. That's the only way we're going to be able to see our trials as joys, as the joy Jesus says the world does not understand and did not give and therefore can't take away. But James for Jay, they're not all the same kind of pain. He's got at least two kinds of pain that he talks about this morning. Uh, one is trials, and the other one is temptations. Trials appear to be things that don't have anything to do with you and your choices and your desires. You didn't pick them. You don't like them. You would never have picked them, and they happen to you anyway. Death is a trial, your own or someone you love. Sickness is a trial, your own or someone you love. Trials, the Bible says here, are events that test you, test your faith. You could say they challenge your faith, like exercise challenges your muscles to make them strong. One sorrow, trial, that James singles out here as an example is poverty. Usually poverty is something that happens to you or happened to your family several generations ago and you you can't get out of it. And especially this is true in the ancient world. And early Christians weren't always poor, but they did tend to be. They had a reputation for being poor. And Probably the vast majority of the original hearers of the letter didn't have very much in the way of material goods, and that's not pleasant, not for anybody. And as we'll see later, later, James is definitely not opposed to attempts to raise the poor out of poverty. He directly commands it. But nevertheless... While you're suffering from the insecurity of poverty and you can't do anything about it, you experience a truth that's harder for people with more money, people often like us, to know in the same way, because money provides an illusion of security. But the truth, James says, is that even the rich will disappear like a flower in the field, and the poor as the Bible says over and over again, are the objects of God's special care and attention and concern. The kingdom of God is a kingdom turned on its head, and the poor can boast in their high position, and the rich only boast that they have been brought low. The pride of the rich isn't in their wealth, but in their identification with the Jesus that was despised and rejected. And so the trials God gives us are a kind of exercise. They make your faith stronger by putting it under stress. You wouldn't have chosen the stress. You're not morally obligated to choose the stress. No one likes these things, and no one has to seek them out. They're going to happen to you anyway. But they result in grace. The many, many things that test us, bereavement and disappointment and poverty and sickness and even persecution, produce, James says, spiritual endurance, just like testing our muscles on the treadmill produces physical endurance. And spiritual endurance, when the believer allows it to have the full effect, results, he says, in becoming a spiritual grown-up mature and complete, lacking in nothing. In the hands of James, then, our pain isn't a punishment, but an opportunity to become more grown up, more complete in the grace and life that God offers us. It's not just moral perfection, although that's a part of it. It's becoming the whole full person that God intends you to be, reflecting the image of God in a unique way, still with your personality, with the things that make you, you. God isn't making us into an army of robots. Still you, but made complete. But not everything, James says, that is wrong or painful in our lives is a trial. 
something that just happens without our choice or input. There are also temptations. And temptations, he says, uh, that's something wrong that we want to do. Something that we want to do that's counter to what God wants for us. Often, temptations spring out of trials, but not always. They can spring out of ease and prosperity just as easily. And in the heat of the moment, when we are caught so painfully between what we know is right and what we want to do very badly, it's easy to blame the situation on God. God is tempting me. But God is not tempting you, James says. God doesn't do it to us. He can't do it to us. He doesn't have any evil desires. There's no temptation for God. And God doesn't want us to have any evil desires either. So it's not God who's tempting us. We may also be inclined to say that it's uh, someone else who isn't God who's inflicting our temptation on us. Uh, The person who's offering us our sixth drink, for example, or the devil, or evil spirits, or whatever. And maybe that's true, in a sense. Certainly, the Bible gives us stories of evil forces and other humans playing the role of tempter. But that's not the whole story. It's not even really the real story. If we didn't love the thing that we were being tempted by, if we didn't want it, no amount of cajoling would have any effect. Remember Jesus' steadfastness in the face of Satan in the wilderness. Nothing Satan could have offered would have made Jesus waver because Jesus didn't love anything that was counter to the will of the Father for him. So whatever the external circumstance may be, James says that it's really our own evil desires that are tempting us. We love the wrong thing, and that's what's causing our problem. We want the thing, whatever it is, that's going to keep us from becoming the person that is mature and complete that God wants us to be, and we're tempted by it. We want to choose it over the promise of God which in the moment looks very pale and weak in comparison with the brightly colored, interesting, delicious thing that our own desires are offering us. But James says that whatever it's promising you, whatever joy or beauty or ease or fulfillment it seems to have, it's going to turn out to be an empty illusion. It looks like a circus, but the balloons are going to pop. And they're not just filled with air, but with toxic gas. They're filled with death, not life or joy. That's what he says here at the end, that only the good gifts of God can live up to their promises, the gifts that come down from the heavenly Father of lights in the beautiful phrase of James. However frail or pale or boring they may seem in comparison to the circus, Only they are going to give birth to new eternal life. We can trust that even when the carnival around us is particularly distracting. And we can trust it even when the rain is beating and the wind is blowing so hard that we can't see the road ahead of us. When the tears have clouded our vision, when we don't understand why, why we're going through what we're going through. We are being made strong in Christ, strong in eternal life, fit to live with God and among the angels. That's the promise of the reading today. So count it all joy, not because the pain makes you happy, but because you can trust that the heavenly Father of lights, in whom there is no darkness of all, is making you full and complete, mature and perfect, He's making you the person he created you to be. So to the God of all grace, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish far more abundantly than all we can ask or think, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. Please rise if you are able and join me in...
the Apostles' Creed, which is in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The hymn is number 324 in the Red Hymnal. to the part in the service where we pray for our world and our special concerns. We are delighted to see Jim back in our worship service and uh, that things have gone well for him. We are delighted, delighted to see you again. In the same vein of Thanksgiving, we have been praying for Rementa, and we will continue to pray for her, but I am glad to report that she is doing much, much better um, and would, would still like your prayers, of course, for her and for her son, Wesley, 
uh, but she is much better, and we give thanks to God for that. We're praying for Mary, who is in uh, rehab after a brief stint in the hospital. We pray that her recovery goes uh, quick and uh, that she finds uh, some reclaimed abilities to move around a little more. And uh, finally, uh, Margaret Powers was briefly in the hospital this week, but is home and is doing well. And we pray uh, that she uh, continues to do well and uh, gets, you know, to, to not go back to the hospital. She spent, I think, two weeks in the hospital this month, two separate times. And uh, we pray. I know she's always watching us live, and she is here with us via our live stream, and we will continue to pray for her. What else needs to come to our attention this morning? Then let us go to our Lord in prayer. Lord, we give you thanks that you have invited us to pray to you and have in fact cared so much about it that you have commanded us to pray to you and we acknowledge that it is a great honor that you would care about our problems and that you would love us enough to want to hear from us and we know that we do not always know how we ought to pray but we know that your spirit prays with us in sighs too deep for words, and you who search our inmost being know what the spirit means. We pray for your church in all the places and all the ways that it exists, from the biggest cathedrals to the smallest house churches. We pray that in all places and in all ways your church would be pure without error without conflict that you would bless each church in the ways that it needs most that you would protect those that are threatened by persecution and stir up those who are more threatened with complacency. And we know that you called your church out of the world for the sake of your world that you love, that you created, and that you sustain. We pray especially for those places that are badly affected by the resurgence of the coronavirus for those who are sick and for those who strive to heal them. We pray that where there is war or the rumor of war, you would bring a just and honorable peace, that where people suffer from floods or fires or other natural disasters, that you would bring quick relief and healing. And we pray for all the leaders of the world, and especially for our own leaders here in the United States, for Joe, our president, and Ralph, our governor, and all those who make and enforce our laws, that you would grant them wisdom, that you would grant them the desire to govern for the good of their people, and not for their own benefit or the benefit of their political party. And we pray for those who are dearest to us in thanksgiving for Jim and Rementa's improvement and prayers that it will continue, for Wesley and Mary and Margaret and others whom we name before you now in silence. Lord, heal those who are sick and comfort 
those who mourn. Accompany those who are dying and bring comfort to those who are lonely or anxious or depressed. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In gratitude and thanksgiving for all God has done for us, let us return to the Lord the tithes and offerings of our life and labor. you have given us everything we have, and we can give you nothing that we have not first received from you. We pray that these gifts would be acceptable in your sight and that you would use them for the building up of your kingdom in this world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The hymn is number 411.
in peace, have courage, love and serve the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.